Good afternoon, uh, good morning, good evening, everyone uh, from wherever you are joining us today. I'm Dr. Masi Wanjala. I'm a family physician from Kenya and um, uh, an executive member of the Wonka Working Party on track. And I will be your moderator for the day. Welcome to the webinar, which is being co-hosted by the Wonka Working Party on Rural Practice and the Wonka YDM Africa region, known as AFRIWON Renaissance and Rural Seeds. Uh, the topic of our webinar today is on the role of um, young family doctors in rural uh, health practice and the role that we can play, knowing that one, uh, about 50% or more of the world's population is the rural population. So if you're talking about advancing health equity, we're talking about universal health coverage. We cannot talk about that without talking about the population that live in rural areas all over the world. And just um, to start us off today, we, we are privileged to have our uh, Wonka YDM chair, uh, Sankarande Nikumara. Um, here with us today. So I'm going to welcome Dr. Sanka uh, to just uh, tell us something about the Wonka YDM and also to just make a statement. Welcome, Dr. Sanka. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Mercy. Uh, good day all, to all of you uh, joining us uh, around the world. Uh, very nice to see you. Um, I think it's a very, very important webinar because as Mercy mentioned, rural practitioners uh, are the uh, are heart of healthcare because in certain countries, sometimes 80% of the population lives in uh, rural areas. So when I talk about rural practice, it's very uh, close to my heart as well, because I started as a rural practitioner in Sri Lanka and uh, uh, I was there I mean, throughout for about more than four years in rural area and still serving uh, more or less to rural communities. Also in Wonka, I started my career as uh, a, a very active member in Wonka in 2016 and joined uh, Wonka, rural uh, Wonka Working Party on uh, Rural Practice in 2016 as a council member. So. Uh, rural Working Party is also very, very close to me, and uh, it has been part of my life for the last six years. So I'm very happy uh, that everyone uh, is hosting this webinar because Africa has a lot of rural areas, and we have a lot of uh, clients and our patients who serve in rural areas. So identifying challenges in rural practices are very important because then we can address them, we can share the best practices, and we can uh, probably learn from the others and uh, improve our practices. Um, so I welcome you all. Uh, I'm really grateful to uh, Wonka Working Party on Rural Practice. Uh, Mercy on behalf of the uh, Rural Practice uh, Group, and Bruce as the chair. And uh, also the Rural Seeds, the Young Doctor Liaisons to the YDN. Um, I'm grateful to uh, Veronica, who was uh, very uh, enthusiastic about, about this webinar from the beginning. And finally, or say last but not least to uh, Etan, our African chair, uh, who, was the, who, was, uh, who was the liaison as well as the, uh, the, the, the main character behind the YDEM uh, in uh, arranging and organizing this webinar. So uh, dear friends, uh, uh, be engaged and uh, learn. let's learn from our colleagues. Thank you very much. Uh, Mercy, over to you. Um, thank you very much, Sanka. That was Sanka, the, y, the, the YDM, that is the Young Doctors Movement uh, Chair in Wonka. So welcome everybody. Um, just a bit of housekeeping, there is language interpretation available in Chinese and Spanish. So if you need language interpretation in either of those two languages, just go to the bottom of your screen 
and click on uh, language interpretation and then select the language that you're comfortable with. So on to our program for today, we have our panelists here with us and I'm going to um, I'm going to invite them to introduce themselves and I'm going to start with um, our AFRIWAN chair, Dr. Nwongo Etan. Please go ahead and introduce yourself. Sorry, I'm muted. Hi, everyone, and good evening. As you rightly said, I'm Dr. Nwongo Etang. Um, I'm a rural um, family physician working here in South Africa. I'm originally from Nigeria, but I've been practicing here in South Africa for about 14 um, years. Um, I, I've, I am, as I mentioned, a family doctor. I'm also an ER doctor, and at the same time, I'm also a house call physician. And in my off-peak period, I also offer telehealth um, services to climb. So I do have a very busy schedule, but nevertheless, um, I'm excited to be here and part of this team. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much, Dr. Etang. Uh, welcome. Uh, now to Dr. Yong. Please go ahead and introduce yourself. Hello. Good day, everyone. My name is Yong. I'm a family uh, medicine specialist from Malaysia. Um, currently, I'm practicing in the Clinic Kesehatan uh, Chomo, which is a government uh, uh, clinic. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for having me today. Thank you so much, Dr. Young. It's great to have you. Welcome. Dr. Natalia? Dr. Natalia, please go ahead and introduce yourself. It seems muted. Yeah, Natalia is there. I can see her. Yes, she should be able to unmute. Dr. Natalia, can you hear us? Uh, she could be having um, some challenges. We can uh, introduce her then and there in that case. Mercy, why don't you go ahead? Okay. Let's move on to Dr. Guha. Please go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, I am Dr. Jajit Guha. Uh, currently, I'm uh, doing my residency in family medicine from Delhi, India. Uh, before this, I worked in a border district of uh, a state um, in the hills of, in, in the rural hills. So I had an experience of uh, working in the uh, rural area for almost three years. Uh, then after completing my residency, I also I have plans to go back there and uh, join. So th thank you for inviting me. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Guha, and welcome. Um, just a minute, let me um, unmute Dr. Natalia. Dr. Natalia, please go ahead and unmute. You, you, you should be able to unmute from your side. I've just sent you a, a prompt to unmute. Dr. Natalia, have you been able to unmute? Um, okay, I think she's dropped off. I uh, probably will just begin and she will introduce herself um, as we go along. And I think I'm going to start with you, uh, Dr. Uh, Guha. Uh, could you share with us any specific challenges that you faced as a young doctor working in a rural area and how you've overcome them? Yeah, sure. Uh, I just, uh, I'll just share my screen once. Uh, so uh, before starting my residency, I after completing my uh, MBBS, I started working in 
a border district uh, in the Uttarakhand state. Uh, so that is a state uh, in the northern India. Uh, it has borders with uh, China and uh, Nepal. So most of the areas in that uh, state uh, comprises hilly region. Almost 70% of the state is hilly region and a few of the 30 to 40% comprises plains. So I worked in a primary health center there and uh, it was overall well equipped. Uh, <clears throat> this was the location of our primary health center. Uh, almost uh, 7,000 feet height was the height of the area. So actually uh, we had almost <clears throat> all of the facilities which are necessary in a primary health center, including uh, three medical officers, two nursing staffs. Uh, we had an ambulance for referral. We uh, provided OPD services, emergency services, as well as uh, antenatal care. So, but what was the problems which we faced there? The, at the, more, the most difficult problem which I faced there, that the terrain was very difficult terrain. Uh, many villages uh, were remote and many of, the, many of them were not connected by roads. Uh, some, although most of the primary health centers were well staffed, but a few of them in the remote areas were not staffed. Uh, so due to the, and some of the people are not aware regarding uh, the health seeking behavior is not there. Referral problems were there, the health center was far away and the people were not having jobs. So they, uh, they did not have a good source of income uh, due to which they were very times reluctant to go to the uh, higher centers. And most of the infection, the diseases which were prevalent mostly were infectious diseases, uh, worm infestations, uh, scabies, uh, fungal skin infections, snake bites were very common in that area, anemia and uh, non-communicable diseases like uh, diabetes and hypertension were also prevalent. And there was a lack of quality emergency care also available uh, in that area. It was not uh, so much good. Uh, Plains, the areas which were in the plains were somewhat well, uh, but still they had a few problems. The more uh, problems which, which were there in, uh, they were in the places which had tribal population. There was very less infrastructure with less manpower and uh, infectious diseases were quite a uh, burdensome in those areas, including uh, tuberculosis. Uh, sanitation problems were there and unemployment, the same issues were there, but which were more in amount. So, uh, I, along with a few of our uh, medical officers, we uh, made a group and we started uh, uh, doing something that we need to do something more because uh, whatever we are doing in the job that is not uh, sufficient enough to provide for the uh, local population. Uh, so the problem is that the, due to the difficult terrain, the people are not able to come to the hospitals. So we, uh, then the other problem was that keep there was less transport facilities, unemployment, low socioeconomic status, uh, due to which the health security was not there. People were actually not uh, uh, willing to go to the higher centers for uh, undergoing some surgeries or some uh, higher tests if they needed. Then uh, due to the lack of jobs, the young population from the villages, they went out to the bigger cities for uh, good, good lifestyle, good jobs. Whereas their parents and other old uh, persons were left behind in the villages. So there was uh, increasing geriatric population in the villages, but no one was there to take care of them. And they had a lot of morbidity also. So uh, these were the challenges which we faced and we started uh, formulating solutions for them. So first thing was that if the patient cannot come to the hospital, then the healthcare services should be provided to them at the village, village level near to their homes. So we know about the WHO and the government, uh, they do a lot of health programs in the villages. But apart from that, we also started doing something uh, that we started a project of training the rural uh, workers. They may not be a, uh, they may not have a health background as such or medical background, but we started uh, educating some informal workers who were enthusiastic in uh, working for the community. So we started a project in which we started uh, screening for hypertension in the villages. And we trained the local uh, a representative from each village how to measure the blood pressure. Then uh, we collected a lot of data and we were quite successful in uh, decreasing the, I mean, uh, in 
counseling the patients regarding how to uh, do lifestyle modifications and when to report to the health center so uh, that was a very important uh, and we although we had to uh, stop the project in between due to funding issues but it was uh, we are planning to uh, again introduce these projects uh, also uh, focusing on child health maternal health and uh, the elderly health then uh, second interventions which we did and which can also which can be done in any area i suppose is that uh, camp based uh, public health intervention um, many times we have seen that uh, people conduct camps uh, medical camps in villages or uh, remote areas but uh, the what happens is that once a camp is conducted there is no follow up that is uh, do, uh, doing a single camp a sporadic camp does not help we uh, we have to do periodic camps so what we are doing we are uh, whenever we do a camp in a remote area where there are no roads available so we go there and uh, collect the data regarding how many patients we saw what were the diseases prevalent in that area what is the local practices do they uh, do they have some local practitioners or they uh, follow some local uh, witchcraft advice then whatever the health issues are there we make a, uh, we formulate a data and according to the data uh, the next follow up camp is also organized within one or two months so that and consistently we do that for around 5 to 6 months and then we see uh, clearly we see that there is a difference in uh, what the uh, what the condition was there 6 months ago and what is now so this is uh, the if we do periodic camps and that is quite helpful but uh, the main thing is that consistency should be there if we do some camps and leave it midway then uh, it's of no use uh then lastly the role of technology technology has been a boon to our age so i'll come to that uh, role of technology later on this was a, uh, a screening camp organized for hypertension and diabetes in the this was a rural area which was approximately 5 to 6 kilometers uh, we had to walk uh, to to reach that area this was an anc checkup camp organized in a village we coordinated with the local school uh, uh, to get uh, some rooms and which were uh, properly sanitized and then used uh, rapid kit based tests a point of care tests were also done in the some of the camps which we organized uh these were some images of a, this is an image of a pediatric camp the we did a screening for uh, diseases like uh, malnutrition and we counseled the parents also regarding how to provide good nutrition to the children uh so now we uh, we are in a uh, era of we live in an, in an era of globalization so we like today we are uh, having this webinar we are uh, all over the world we are connected to each other so we can uh, take anyone's help whenever we need so similarly in organizing in uh, providing health care for the uh, rural population as well uh, we can we should take uh, help from the other agencies the other uh, trusts or trust organizations who are working in that uh, region uh, so by coordinating with other other agencies it becomes quite easy um, to do the task in this is an image where we did a health camp in a very um, close to the indian indo china border and we took the help of the army medical forces to uh, this can be done in any part of the world i suppose this is utilize this is an image to depict uh, whatever it is uh, available minimum we should utilize it so uh, this village uh, it was this was a very far off village uh, from our center uh, there was there were no roads available there so people used to use uh, mules for transporting the goods and other stuff so we when we did a camp we uh, took our uh, screening equipments as well as our few of the basic uh, essential drugs there uh, so we used it for the transportation facility so lastly i come what is most important the role of technology in uh, today's world 
uh, for the remote places we can uh, do which is, which has already been done we can do telemedicine video consultations so it can be of two types uh, it can be patient to doctor or doctor to doctor uh, in our center we had uh, uh, the the facility of teleconsultation where in in the cases where we were not able to uh, reach to a certain diagnosis we could consult a senior uh, consultant or any other doctor for the expert advice and uh, field devices were also made available to us uh, like uh, the random blood sugar kits which were uh, uh, somewhat they were they could be connected to the smartphones and some smart ecg devices were also made available which we could connect to the smartphones and uh, expert opinion could be taken if needed uh, we can uh, this we have not not started but we have an idea to start automated google dashboards in which uh, first we will train the uh, the health workers the village level health workers who will screen the population and they will feed the data in the google sheets so we can access the data real time and also uh, provide uh, the necessary advice and intervention if needed uh this was this is just an image uh, we where we as a group had started telemedicine during the covid era in the for the difficult areas in the state now the role of the information education and communication activities which is uh, very important uh, we uh, some of the in the some of the schools nearby we organized uh, this uh, communication activities awareness camps for tobacco cessation to make the uh, the children aware about drug abuse and alcohol abuse then we also organized a few camps in and for the uh, female population the adolescents females in the schools about menstrual hygiene uh, these camps were organized and these should be these these are uh, the these public health camps are needed at the primary level that should should always be done this was a camp which was uh, organized for uh, to educate the females and the young uh, the adolescent females for uh, menstrual hygiene then this is our uh, this was our, my primary health center in which uh, we were uh, giving some uh, the information related uh, related to vaccination to the uh, local village workers so the education is very important in providing the primary health care this is our initiative the by the name of uh, swast himalaya abhiyan in english it means that uh, the healthy himalayas uh, for in, in the state of uttarakhand so this is a organization which we are which we uh, are a member uh, lastly i would uh, like to end my presentation with uh, my favorite quote uh, that uh, strive not to be a success but rather to be of uh, value so i thank vanka uh, uh, for giving me this opportunity to uh, share my experiences regarding the challenges uh, which as a family doctors we face in the rural areas thank you wow thank you so much uh, dr guha i think um, that was really amazing i was just struggling to keep up with all the innovative things that you have done to really deliver healthcare to those hard to reach areas and to the rural population there's so much you're doing and i especially loved the interagency cooperation i think that is something sometimes we lack especially in the medical field how do we bring in other sectors and other agencies to help us strengthen healthcare service delivery so thank you so much for that we will have uh once all the presenters are done we will have a q and a session so if you have any question for dr guha please write it down somewhere and we will give you an opportunity to ask it after the panelists are done speaking um now i'm going to move on to dr etang and uh to you dr etang um i'd like to ask you what are some of the innovative approaches that you have taken to provide healthcare in your rural health practice seeing as africa has a lot of challenges even just with mobile phone coverage and such so what are some of the innovative approaches you've used and um, which ones have worked for you? Please go ahead, Dr. Ayton. Thank you so much for that. So 
Um, as a background, um, I have the privilege of working both in the public and the private sector. Um, I start my day in the public sector and I just transit to try private, flex, private sector, but I have I work mostly in the rural areas. And the biggest challenge um, that we've been, we struggled is having healthcare workers in the rural areas, having enough healthcare workers in the rural area. I'm going to use the public center where I do work, which I'll not mention just for privacy purposes, but I, I am the only doctor in that facility. Now, being the only doctor in the facility, uh, there's limitations in how much you can divide, um, divide yourself in terms of giving help or um, um, health services to, to, to people. So we are using a lot of telehealth services very much. And even though there might be issues with privacy, but at the moment we're using what is available in the rural population where I, where I do serve. Most of the people here are, have access to WhatsApp, which is a ubiquitous app that we all use for day-to-day -day communication. And we use it for a lot of things. One, we use it with a little of automation to remind patients of their appointments in the rural areas. We use it um, to, there's this thing on WhatsApp that is a very important tool that people take for granted. We only probably, use it, probably only use it for entertainment purposes, which is the WhatsApp status. So most times we just share things about our families and our friends. So what we did is that we have a, diff, a different WhatsApp, um, separate from the personal, because you want to separate your personal life and to an extent, if not, patients will be reaching out to you at 2 a.m. in the morning, which I personally do not have a problem with. So you use your WhatsApp status to give recurrent health education on issues where they can follow. Yes, there's Facebook, but people seem to be much more endeared to WhatsApp. Next, we use WhatsApp also for some updates and, um, about medication, updates about their conditions. And then finally, we also use WhatsApp for consultation. There are quite a few platforms available here um, for consulting with patients. Um, there are ones that are used for inter-hospital communication because having worked working in a rural area, it is very difficult to get access to specialists in these areas. So you have to liaise with your regional, with your district, regional, and tertiary hospitals to get health um, assistance for your patients from that. There have been some innovative um, platforms here. Um, I'll just use one of the names, we call it the Vula app, it means open, where we're able to have consultations in the rural hospitals, um, in our rural hospitals with the big hospitals. Just as a, a caveat here, one of, the one of the major challenges which we have uh, is about retaining young doctors in rural areas. It is very difficult to retain doc young doctors in rural areas because of a lot of issues, I'll mention some of them. One, rural areas often face a scarcity of healthcare professionals, including doctors, nurses, and mostly specialists. So this shortage puts additional pressure on young family doctors to provide comprehensive care um, to the patients in those areas. The next one, which he has already talked about, is about a ge geographical barriers. So rural areas are often very remote and we have limited transportation options. The area where I work, there are four, three, three or four ambulances. Now, our, our referral hospital is over 30 kilometers away. And if those ambulances for some reason have to take a patient, because where I work, we do not have the ability to provide even cesarean sections for emergency pregnancy options. So it all have to be transferred to a district or rural hospital. Those, cha those challenges make it difficult for patients who need to be transferred when you have limited access to ambulances. The next challenge also have is um, about the socioeconomic disparities of our community. You know, poverty, limited access to education, and lack of resources it contributes to reduced healthcare access and poor health outcomes among rural populations. And I'm not sure how people are struggling, but mental health um, uh, is everywhere. And rural populations we also face mental health challenges, uh, including limited access to mental health services high levels of stress and lack of awareness about mental health. So you know, for a young family doctor that wishes to work in a rural area, he needs to equip himself 
with at least the basics of how to manage acute psychosis, being the common, the common um, um, mental health conditions that are seen in, your, in the area. Um, some of the doctors that work in the area, the biggest challenge is also to talk about is access to care for those who have families, like schools for their children, um, growth opportunities for them, and some form of isolation that they experience there, which makes rural healthcare a little bit challenging and not that attractive for them. So this is one of the challenges that we face. But in the context of these challenges, the use of technology, the use of AI, the use of telehealth platforms has been very instrumental in, in helping uh, patients, giving advice to patients for non-emergency care. Obviously, emergency care, they have to come in to see the doctors. And I'll pause here for now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Etang, for sharing your experience. I think um, one thing that has just stuck with me is the use of WhatsApp, because WhatsApp has quite a high coverage as a social media and chatting platform. And the fact that you have been able to use that to reach your patients is quite um, amazing. So thank you so much. Um, we are going to have a question and answer session after this. And um, if you have any questions for Dr. Etang, please um, make sure you write them down or put them up in the chat and you'll be able to ask after this. I'm now going to move on to Dr. Yong. Um, Dr. Yong, you've mentioned you have quite an experience do, um, in rural healthcare and rural health practice in Malaysia. So I just want to welcome you to first just um, share some of the challenges that you have had or you have met and also how you have managed to address them in Malaysia. So welcome, Dr. Yong. Hello, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, my name is Albert. Uh, I'm a family physician from Malaysia. So today I'll be sharing a little bit about um, um, rural health. Um, I have worked in East of Malaysia and as well as uh, West Malaysia. So, um, in both rural areas at the moment. And uh, uh, I would like to share, you know, uh, some of the um, challenges and how I uh, overcome uh, the, those challenges and provide, uh, you know, uh, the optimal care for my patients. First of all, I would like to thank everyone uh, for inviting me to uh, share this, uh, uh, share my experience with all of you. I'd like to check whether you can see my slides. Yes, we can yes. see them. Okay, yeah, thank you. So uh, I'd like to introduce Malaysia to you. It's a very beautiful country. Our capital is called Kuala Lumpur and we have about 30, uh, 32 million uh, people. So as you can see here, um, majority of our people are the Bumiputras. All right, making up almost 70% of our people, followed by Chinese and Indian. And Malaysia is indeed a multi-ethnic country. Yeah. So do you know that uh, Malaysia has the tallest twin towers in the world? And, um, and not only that, you know, we also have um, you know, the second largest uh, building in the world after Burj Khalifa, right? Now, talking about universal health coverage, you know, WHO has actually um, uh, declared that, you know, Malaysia has achieved universal health coverage. So what does it mean? Universal health coverage means that the people can use promotive, preventive, curative, rehabilitative, and as well as palliative health services that they need uh, of sufficient quality, and it does not expose the user to financial hardship. Well, in Malaysia, on the overall health outcomes, you know, we have experienced laudable uh, improvements over the last decade. Malaysians are now living much longer compared um, in the 1970s. And the life expectancy for male now is at about 72 um, years old. And for women, it's about 77 years old. Well, in the 1950s, the infant deaths per 1,000 live birth were, at, were as high as 76. And with the improved healthcare system, Malaysia has managed to bring the number down to 6.7 deaths per 1,000 live birth in 
2022. Well, compared to 1950, Malaysia also managed to reduce the maternal mortality uh, ratio from a staggering of 540 maternal deaths to less than 30 deaths per 100,000 live births. Well, despite the positive achievements, you know, the gains in health are uneven across the population in Malaysia, unfortunately. Malaysia's healthcare system promises universal access uh, to healthcare for its people, but health inequalities suggest that universal access alone does not ensure good health for all. Rather, health outcomes are due to a mix of factors, including income, working environments, and individual behaviors. When this determinants are unevenly distributed in the society. This contributes to health inequalities within the population. Thus, public policies play an important role to reduce these health inequalities. Just to highlight a few problems, one is the access to healthcare um, in rural areas is really a real issue. You know, up to 30% of rural population needs to travel at least three to five kilometers to reach a basic health facilities. Well, according to the Malaysia Multidimensional Poverty Index, um, health indicators reflect Malaysia's focus on ensuring universal access to health care, with virtually all Malaysians having access to public health facilities at substantially subsidized price. According to the World Bank, only 1.4% of households in Malaysia experience catastrophic health care spending. However, there's mounting evidence demonstrating that health is not just determined by healthcare and having access to it. Rather, health outcomes are due to a mix of factors apart from healthcare, including living condition, work and environment, um, as well as behavior. Well, inequalities are a matter of life and death, of health and sickness, of well-being and misery, creating a fairer society is fundamental to improving the health of the whole population and assuring a fairer distribution of good health. One well, the second um, challenges that I would like to highlight is lack of proper equipment. Rural cl clinics and health services are only equipped with basic healthcare. Smaller district hospitals do not have high-tech facilities for investigation or treatment. For example, in the state where I have worked before in Sarawak, up to 40% of the state public health clinics do not have pharmacies. 70% of these clinics do not have lab service, and up to 90% do not have X-ray services. Well, in 2020, Malaysia's doctor population ratio is one doctor for every 454 people, and that has surpassed um, the one doctor to 500 people ratio recommended by the WHO. However, the distribution of doctors, especially in rural areas, is unequal compared to urban area, just what Dr. Itang has uh, pointed out. So this is a map to show you the distribution, the ratio of doctor to patient in Malaysia. In Sarawak, where I have worked before, uh, it is one doctor to 900 plus patient compared to um, the Malaysian ratio of one to 454. And according to um, the state government, the Sarawak state government, 98 out of the 215 rural clinics in Sarawak do not have a medical doctor. Well, the fourth problem uh, in rural communities is that uh, every three out of 10 rural patients actually had an undiagnosed medical problem. Well, the goal of health for all draws attention to the all. At present, health resources are not shared equally by all the people. There is still significant gaps in many countries, and health is the privilege of the few. Indicators should reflect progress towards correcting this imbalance and closing the gap between those who have health and those who do not. Well, what we can do as family doctors uh, in facing health inequality, especially in rural areas. Well, Malaysia has achieved great success in improving its people's health. However, uh, 
several challenges remain, including the unequal distribution of health outcomes or health inequalities. So this framework summarizes the mechanisms generating health inequalities. Well, you can read from left to right, we see that uh, the social economic and political context generates a social structure in which population are stratified by income, occupation, and more. The context and resulting social structure are known as the structural determinants. Well, these structural determinants do not affect health directly, but through direct determinants. Health inequalities are generated when these direct determinants are unevenly distributed, reflecting and perpetrating other social inequalities. In other words, individual experience differences in exposure and vulnerability to health promoting and compromising conditions based on their respective social status. Well, I would like to start off with um, West Malaysia, where I have worked before. I had the opportunity to uh, work in both East and West Malaysia. And today I would like to share my experience working as family medicine specialist and what I can do and what we can do in the capacity of a family medicine specialist in addressing the rural health challenges. Well, when I got my posting after passing the exam, I prayed that I did not get um, the rural area as I did not um, you know, wish to be separated from my family. Unfortunately, my wish did not come true. I was posted to one of the most rural, most remote region of Malaysia, which is uh, Borneo. So I was posted to Song Kapit, which is located about two hours boat ride away from the city of Cebu. And um, a few months down uh, my posting, uh, the, the COVID-19 pandemic struck and the boat service was ceased. And as a result, many of my patients could not travel to Cebu or Kuching to receive their treatment, especially you know, talking about cancer patients. As a result, their disease progressed and I started to see cancer patients came into my clinic uh, with pain and other symptoms. So in response to the new needs, you know, I started the cancer registry and uh, as well as the palliative care service. Well, due to the lockdown, as um, you know, what you can see here, health system, social factor, physical environment, psychosocial circumstances where um, most of my patients could not travel to the nearest tertiary hospital. And, um, and there was no palliative care service available in uh, my clinic at that uh, point of time. So the changes that I made that time was to create a new service, which is the community palliative care service. So I had this young man came in um, with colorectal cancer uh, in that lot of pain and, um, and he actually had a prolapse stoma and due to, to, to the pandemic, he could not uh, get the stoma back for himself. So um, at presentation, he was in a lot of pain. So I started him with Tramadol, uh, which was the strongest medicine that I had at that point and we had to source morphine for him the following day. And we also helped him to source the uh, stoma back. And um, uh, with the intervention given, his pain was controlled and he managed to get his stoma back in place. And um, you know, overall, we have helped him to uh, have a sense of control over his illness and improve his quality of life. And towards the end, you know, he needed a wheelchair. And for that, we uh, source it for him. So to prepare my team you know, for the new service, I had to um, uh, train them. Um, so I um, you know, um, organized teaching sessions for them on basic palliative care and also develop a clocking sheet to facilitate a comprehensive assessment and management of um, palliative patients. At that time, we did not have access to um, essential medications such as control release morphine, dexamethasone, and some other medication in palliative care. For your you know, information, just three years ago, you know, um, in a state as big as Sarawak, we had not a single palliative care physician. All right? And I had to put up a request to get the medication uh, from the consultant palliative physician from West Malaysia. 
uh, to get the essential medication into um, uh, Sarawak. So once the community palliative care service had been developed, I engaged the district hospital and has established the networking. Since then, we received numerous referrals and we were able to ensure seamless care achieved for patients with palliative care needs. So this is the patient. I had the opportunity to care uh, for this lovely lady who had uh, breast cancer with meds to lung. She was in a lot of pain when she came to, uh, first came to me and was breathless due to the massive lung effusion. Well, with uh, the intervention given, her pain was controlled and we managed to discuss about end-of-life care. And despite the limited resources that we had, we managed to achieve a good death. So not only adults needed palliative care, we also had many children who needed it as well. So, you know, uh, as a young family physician, I had very limited knowledge and skill in caring for children with um, palliative care needs. So I decided to reach out. And at that point, you know, um, uh, it was locked down. And uh, uh, the only way we communicate with other healthcare providers uh, was via Zoom. And uh, we had our first uh, and subsequently monthly case discussion to better manage children uh, with palliative care needs. So in my clinic, I had cared for many children uh, with special needs. However, we did not have um, speech and also occupational therapies in the whole division. And in the whole of uh, Sarawak State, we only had a handful of these therapies. So with the, with the COVID pandemic, there was a blessing in disguise. You know, telemedicine became popular and we had the opportunity to collaborate with an NGO from Ipo Para in West Malaysia to deliver speech and occupational therapies via Zoom to my young patients. So with the intervention given, we have seen tremendous improvement in children. So what I would like to highlight is that um, um, speech and occupational therapies can be delivered, you know, 1,347 kilometers um, away apart across the South China Sea. The other issues that my community are facing is the rising threat of malaria nolasai. And we have seen a significant rise in malaria nolasai cases from only 376 cases in 2008 to over 4,000 cases in 2018 with 12 mortalities from this treatable disease. So if you look into this framework again, you know, um, what I did was, you know, I piloted a pre-exposure prophylaxis with chloroquine and strengthening the malaria nolasai presumptive treatment for my rural community. And with the result that I had, I went back to the policy makers, uh, to the state health department to um, uh, implement this um, uh, statewide in Sarawak. So this is the pre-exposure prophylaxis package looks like. We have, uh, a simple brief about the disease, and then the consent form, the prescription, and the, as well as a three-month supply of um, chloroquine. So besides creating a PEP, I have also engaged the community with series of malaria outreach by giving lectures and malaria screening. So all these efforts had helped to increase awareness about the disease, and the people were more receptive to PEP with chloroquine. Well, as I mentioned earlier, many clinics in Sarawak um, are without a medical doctor. Thus, empowering the medical assistant and nurses are crucial in managing severe malaria. I had created this uh, management flowchart with my pharmacist, and we wrote it out for the carpet division and later adopted by the Sarawak State Health Department. Moving forward, you know, another issue that faced by my uh, local community uh, uh, smoking, yeah. Um, this paper uh, from our local researchers showed that you know the prevalence of smoking among secondary school students in Sarawak is extremely high. So the prevalence stood at thirty two point eight percent with mean age of smoking initiation at age twelve years old. So based on this framework, what we can do is we can intervene via education and um, 
uh, health impacting behaviors. So I started engaging school management in Song and delivered uh, lectures on the danger of smoking, followed by screening and smoking cessation intervention. So I'd like to share um, a couple of photos uh, of what we have done. We had group interventional program uh, carry out and, um, and, and thankfully all the children under our program managed to quit smoking uh, towards the end of the program. So as you can see here, um, another, uh, beside the smoking issue, the young people in this region had another social problem, which is teenage pregnancy. The youngest patient that I had uh, under my care was only 11 years old. And, you know, based on one of the uh, local uh, papers, you know, Kapit had the highest teen pregnancy in the whole of Sarawak state. And in response to the problem, you know, I also initiated numerous engagement with uh, young people in Kapit to empower them on sexual health and as well as healthy living. Well, now I uh, shift the focus, you know, from, um, from Sarawak back to where I am practicing now in uh, um, Peninsula Malaysia. So my interest in palliative care actually uh, uh, grew stronger and I aim to make community palliative care available in every district in Malaysia after having seen you know, um, how my patient actually uh, struggle you know, in rural areas. Well, in Malaysia, we are still lacking in universal health coverage, particularly in palliative care. And the community palliative care providers in Malaysia are mainly from the NGO, and most of them mainly in urban area and leaving the rural patients behind. And um, there is also limited services from the government health facilities. So last year, I um, had the idea to, uh, to uh, pilot a project uh, on community palliative care, and I presented it at district level and move on to, uh, um, to get the approval from uh, uh, at the national level. So um, after a few months of uh, hard work, um, we managed to um, officially start our service. You know, uh, this team is a full-time uh, full team caring for patients with palliative care needs in the uh, Kinta district with a population of 1 million people. So this pilot project is crucial to develop, you know, to, uh, to the development of community palliative care in Malaysia. As, you know, um, as I said, um, um, mentioned earlier, uh, we, we plan to, you know, um, uh, roll this um, project out to other states um, in Malaysia. Uh, we are also the first in Para uh, state to prepare morphine at primary care level. Before this, we had to um, send our request to the nearest hospital and it, it took about uh, two to three days you know, to get the morphine. So now we had the liberty to prescribe it uh, at uh, primary care level. So this is the uh, opening ceremony officiated by our state health um, um, uh, director. And you know, this opening ceremony also attracted um, uh, many press coverage. And uh, we have also helped to increase awareness about palliative care. So besides, you know, um, um, you know, of it started a new service um, in, in, in my district, I also um, um, took up a new responsibility um, by uh, going around uh, Malaysia uh, to um, deliver and to train uh, other states to develop their own uh, domiciliary palliative care um, services. So this is one of uh, the pictures. This is in Malacca State. This is in Pahang. This is in the Negri Sembilan. And um, and this is uh, in Perak State. And lastly, um, I just came back from Sabah, yeah, uh, where I shared uh, and trained uh, the team uh, over there. 
So I have made my proposal to the um, uh, Ministry of Health, which is to establish dedicated domiciliary palliative care service in every district to ensure the universal access to palliative care throughout Malaysia, where we can have a focused care, you know, um, by uh, training the people, um, you know, shorten and enhance uh, the training. We can develop specialty in palliative care, minimizing duplication of work and maximizing the manpower. Well, um, back in where I'm practicing now, uh, we also have uh, our indigenous people uh, who are called the Orang Asli. And um, they are basically the descendants of the uh, Pleocent era, uh, the earliest inhabitants of Malay, uh, Malayan uh, Peninsula. And as of 2004, the population of Orang Asli was estimated at 150,000, which is about less than 1% uh, of the national population. And uh, just for your information, we have uh, you know, many subgroups of Orang Asli, um, you know, and some of them are Negrito. As the name suggests, they are generally physically smaller in stature, dark skin with typically woolly or frizzy hair, uh, and with broad nose. Um, Sonoi are slightly taller, their skin is much lighter color and they, are, and they have wavy rather than frizzy hair. Well, you know, um, I have never seen a malnourished, uh, you know, uh, child, uh, you know, um, as a young doctor before I became a family medicine specialist. And I, I always thought that, you know, malnourished children could only be found in Africa, but I was uh, proven wrong when I was during, um, it was during my training, I actually uh, met a few uh, severely malnourished children. And one of them uh, is this uh, child who was five and she, she weighed only eight kilogram. So the two uh, form of malnutrition that we see in uh, Para among our indigenous people are marasmus, which is the visible severe uh, wasting where they do not have fat tissue or very minimum uh, fat tissue where we, you know, the wasting can be uh, uh, clearly seen over the shoulder, arm, buttock and thigh region. Besides uh, marasmus, we also have poshoko where the wasting uh, is not apparent, but they do have, you know, edema. Just to give you a, a little bit of background about the indigenous people of Malaysia, the poverty rate for our Orang Asli remain as high as 77%, and 35% of them are classified as hard poor poor. The infant mortality rate for Orang Asli are more than three times the national average, 19 versus 6.2 per thousand live birth. Orang Asli children under five years old are 15 times more likely to die than Malay, Chinese, or Indian children and malnutrition rates appear to be increasing in Orang Asli children with more fatalities on presentation to government hospitals. So one of the um, challenges that faced by the local people are uh, you know, losing their land, uh, ancestral uh, lands. And um, you know, many uh, of their lands uh, were taken away uh, and made way for mega project logging activities, mining and agriculture. And this is uh, some of the pictures taken by myself and my team. As you can see, you know, um, uh, deforestation is, um, is, is going on rapidly. And as a result, you know, uh, uh, the waters are polluted. With the climate change, uh, we, you know, we see more and more um, extreme weathers, flooding and as, as well as drought. And um, this um, um, have, led to you know, uh, a deteriorating of health uh, status among the indigenous people. And school dropout rate is also very high and many of our indigenous people do not have access to clean water, electricity, let alone um, uh, healthcare. So in response to the need, you know, uh, with the help of local church, you know, we started uh, our outreach since 2014 to present time to improve the lives of indigenous people. So we carry out monthly medical outreach to uh, various villages. Uh, some we need to travel like up to three, four hours 
uh, and then we need to cross rivers and some we need to uh, take boat to reach uh, the villages. So we run our clinic open air, as you can see here, we just put up tables and, uh, and see our patients. So we carry out a lot of activities like deworming, de uh, screening for malnutrition, uh, TB screening, malaria screening, and so on. So we also um, uh, mobilize our uh, dental uh, mobile clinic into uh, um, uh, the difficult to reach areas. And we um, actively, you know, uh, teaching the children on oral health uh, by uh, supplying them with uh, toothbrush, toothpaste, and, our, and we get our dental nurse, you know, to engage the parents and children on a proper way of brushing teeth. So we run our clinic uh, everywhere, even under the open air. So um, due to the climate change, you know, uh, emergency relief is, uh, is, is part of our, our, our work. You know, food aid is integral uh, to uh, our SOA community development program. Uh, hunger and malnutrition issue greatly affect our orang asli communities, especially babies and young children. So um, we provide short and long-term food aid. You know, uh, food aid is given for emergency relief caused by uh, floods and droughts. So we collaborate with um, many um, uh, local um, companies where they sponsor us this uh, food pack, which we source from Rise Against Hunger organization. We also supply uh, our uh, children with rice, uh, anchovies, iodized salt, sugar, fortified beverages, and biscuits. So these are some of the uh, monthly activity that we, we do. You know, we pack the food and then deliver to uh, children whom we have uh, detected the malnutrition. So we also help uh, to source uh, for this uh, F75 and Rosomal, which are important uh, to, tre uh, to treat severe malnutrition. And um, you know, we I'm, I personally source these uh, products from France, and we uh, shared it with all the hospitals uh, in Para and as well as uh, clinics. So we also share our fortified rice and food basket with uh, the hospital, uh, uh, you know, uh, and they help us to uh, deliver it to uh, the malnourished children. In areas where malnutrition prevalence uh, uh, is high, we actually set up a milk house. Um, so we um, appoint you know, uh, local volunteers to prepare two basic meals for the children. Uh, basically, we're providing uh, milk and biscuits. So this is some of the uh, pictures. So as we um, journey with uh, the local communities, we know that uh, medicine alone is not sufficient. And thus we venture into construction of water and sanitation and hygiene facilities. So as I mentioned, you know, uh, with the climate change, you know, um, the water source is affected. Hence, we decided to build mini uh, water catchment area and installing pipes to channel water to the village. So in certain area where we don't have a water catchment area, we had to uh, duck well to ensure water supply is sufficient. As I mentioned, um, um, many of uh, these indigenous uh, young children, they do not have access to education. And for that uh, reason, we have uh, uh, set up two schools. We run uh, two schools uh, operated by uh, the local communities. You know, we bring the indigenous people to uh, our cities to train for about six months, and then we send them back to their village. And um, yeah, so these are some of the uh, pictures. So with this school around, we actually address uh, the malnutrition as well. So for those children uh, coming to our uh, school, they receive uh, two meals uh, per day from Monday to uh, Friday. So climate change has also impacted the lives of the indigenous people with inconsistent harvest from the jungle 
And to ensure stable food source, we have introduced agriculture uh, to um, uh, the people. So this is the fish farm that uh, we are running. And at the moment, you know, the um, most of the village that we are, we've been to, um, reaching out, they are self-sufficient. So in the in initial stage, you know, we provided them with uh, the seeds, you know, um, for them to uh, start off their uh, farming projects. So we also carry out awareness and training programs uh, for uh, parents uh, to recognize warning signs, you know, how to uh, provide basic um, uh, CPR and so on. Well, I think that's all uh, from me. Thank you so much uh, for listening. Wow. Um, Albert, I don't know what to say. I was just amazed as you were going through everything because you have covered so many things from how you entered into rural practice for those who are wondering how to find themselves in rural practice and then what do you do when you get there? And you've done quite a lot. You've covered things even to do with community-oriented primary care. You've covered addressing socioeconomic determinants of health for rural and indigenous people. You've covered the issue of the environmental effects, effects of things like COVID. I think we might just have to have a separate webinar for people to just really digest everything. So thank you so much for sharing with us. For those who have jo uh, joined us later, please, um, if you have any questions for Albert or any of the other panelists, we will have a Q&A session after this for you to ask your questions. Thank you so much, Albert. Now we're going to move on to our next panelist, Dr. Natalia Galarza. Um, who has experience both working in a low income, uh, in a low middle income country and also high income country and experience also with uh, medical education amongst other things. Uh, Dr. Natalia, welcome. Uh, please introduce yourself. And then I'm going to ask you um, if you could um, uh, talk about what are some of the skills or training that young doctors would need to equip themselves with to be able to, you know, thrive in rural health practice. Uh, not only professionally, but also, you know, personally, because you find that a lot of young doctors find themselves far flung away from their families, away from their friends. So how do they deal with that and ensure they have a well-balanced life both professionally and personally? And what are the skills that they need to equip themselves with in order to thrive in rural health practice? Over to you, Dr. Natalia. Welcome. Good morning, everyone. Uh, buenos dias a todos. Uh, I'm Dr. Natalia Galarza. I practice in the uh, Southwest United States, right in the border with Mexico and Arizona. Um, I am what they call an international medical graduate here in the States. I graduated from a school in Mexico and then emigrated um, and did my residency in family medicine here in the States in a semi-rural suburban area. Um, I was part of that, I stay in that program after I graduated as faculty. And this year I moved to south of the county where it's actually a rural area to start our own residency program there and act as the program director for that program. So right now we're starting our program from scratch. Um, and the reason why we do this is because of all the necessities that everybody has stock um, in the rural areas. Um, here in the States, there's only two populations that have universal health care, and that's the Native Americans, indigenous population with Indian Health Services. And the other ones are inmates from federal and state prisons. Everybody else in the population has to um, have coverage by themselves, what we call Medicaid, that is federally and state funded, but that's through application and not everybody qualifies or through private insurance from work, or you know, thanks to the Affordable Care Act uh, from President Obama, if they can afford the payments for, for private insurance uh, on their own, out of pocket. So the um, healthcare, um, unfortunately here, um, is very, it's a mixed bag depending on where you are. There's even areas in urban areas like downtown LA that is considered underserved 
area for healthcare because the lack of doctors are readily available. Um, and obviously rural areas are very um, underserved when it comes to access uh, to care. Um, and the people that are able to afford it. One of the things that we need the most and have made real advancements over the past 10 to 15 years is increase the number of medical students. Now, the problem is that there's not enough residencies. Um, and that's what we have been trying to change through legislations and grants. Um, that's actually how the current residency program that I'm constructing in the organization where I am um, is thanks to some legislation changes that made it um, possible to fund the program. Um, so there's definitely positive changes. And when you think about family medicine here in the States, more than 50% of the emergency departments and rural health access or critical access hospital in the state are actually um, run by family doctors. And after the pandemic, we have shown that we are the specialty that is very dynamic and can cover many of the areas and necessities because of our training in pediatrics and all the way to geriatric patients. Um, as a specialty, I think, the pandemic was good in a sense because we were able to show our worth. Um, but now we just have to continue to being able to fund more uh, family medicine programs. And one of the things is not just fund programs in urban areas, but also um, in rural areas. One of the things that I would say has been more important after seven years in medical education and educating residents is teaching the residents about emotional intelligence. We have all um, heard about this term, but I don't think we have ever really been teach about it, especially not in um, medical school. And it's really important in the sense that we we don't, we all know that we're book smart and able to uh, process different problems and solve problems. But what about how we manage our emotions? And that sometimes if studies show that that actually determines a lot of success in life and personal and professional and being able to manage professional and personal life is important to be successful all over. And emotional intelligence plays a key role in this. Um, having what we call now adult learners, you know, someone that is self-motivated um, and able to control their emotions and their response, not ignore their emotions, but just control them and work with them to fulfill the goal that they have. Um, this is important because that usually is a person that doesn't need external motivation um, and they're able to be alone. So uh, that is really important in rural medicine, not because we want people to be isolated, but we want people to find fulfillment within the work that they have and be self-motivated to continue working in there. Yes the system has to change. Um, there's actually multiple studies now that show that having multidisciplinary teams and being part of that team reduces burnout. Because we were even discussing some of my colleagues and me last week that you know as much yoga and exercise that you can do if you keep going back to the toxic environment, it doesn't matter how fulfilled and recharged you are as a person, you have to also go back to an environment where you want to go and it's desirable to work. Another thing that I would say that is very important for young doctors to realize is advocacy. We have to advocate for ourselves within our institutions and within 
our organizations, within our friends and our states, um, not only for better outcomes for our patients, but better outcomes for ourselves. That's actually one of the things that I admire the most about other professions. They're really good at closing ranks. And somebody mentioned earlier that as doctors, we don't really collaborate among ourselves. And also that comes to when we have to fend for ourselves and defend ourselves. We're even from medical school, we're thought that, oh, you'd be a good doctor and stay in the office. That doesn't cut it anymore. We have to go out, we have to advocate, we have to talk to the share of the service, we have to talk to the CEO, we have to talk to our um, local representatives and state and the federal government, because this is how we're really going to change policy and benefit our patients. So, um, you know, studies have shown that also advocating gives you a better or a lower rate in burnout and improves outcomes, not only for your practice, but also for um, your patients. Because if you're able to change policies, it will benefit the community that you are. And like Dr. Young was saying, change those social determinants of health. Because sometimes, as most of the time, studies have shown that as much time as we spend with the patient, if the patient goes back and sees those social determinants of health and social political determinants of health have not changed, their health, unfortunately, will be minimal impacted by the changes that we do in the clinic with them. So I would say that those are the two most important things that we can do for young doctors when we educate them, teach them about emotional intelligence and how to achieve them, and advocacy, advocacy in all levels, uh, from their organization all the way to legislative uh, levels in their state and federal. And once we do that actually as a group and understand how powerful we are, it will be even better for us and for our patients. I always tell my residents and my students that as doctors, there's no other profession besides politics, where you touch so many people's lives in your lifetime. You know, here in the States, it's calculated that as a doctor, you will probably see more than um, 50,000 people from your start, your, the start of your medical education until you finish. So no other profession gives you that power other than politics. And as politics, we should have the influence to really have better outcomes for ourselves and our patients. So thank you, everyone. Um, I think that's uh, one of the message that I have learned, especially for rural practice. It's so hard to go out and you don't want to leave your patients because you know uh, sometimes they're very dependent on you and every day it counts. But what we can do also outside of the office for them is very, very important. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Natalia. I think that was wonderful because um, you've covered quite a range of things, all um, from the kind of skills that family doctors already have, you know, to see everyone across the life course in pediatrics, in geriatrics. And adding on to that, I, I think I love the component about emotional intelligence and how you manage your emotions and not ignore them, because um, rural practice can be overwhelming, it can be lonely, it can be and I think it's important to really just help you maintain your own balance and also, you know, maintain a good communication and relationship with patients. And I also love the advocacy because um, you know that there are actually statistics that show that if you advocate, you know, it also helps you. So thank you so much for today and for sharing with us today. And now I'd like to move on to our audience today. If you have any questions for our our panelists, um, we had um, we had Doctor Doctor Guha, we had Doctor Young, we have uh, Doctor Natalia, and also Doctor Etang. So if you have any questions, you can direct it specifically to one of the panelists, or you can just um, generally ask the question and. Either um, 
one of out, out of the four of them can pick up that question and answer. So okay. please raise your hand and I'll be able to um, unmute you. That, any questions? That. So if you have any questions, please raise your hand. Okay, I'm seeing one hand, Brunei. Let me just um, unmute you and then you can take your question. Hi, okay, go ahead. Everyone, thank, thank you, Mercy. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for your wonderful presentations. My question is for you, Natalia. I really appreciated what you said. Most recently, the advice that you would give to young doctors um, coming up in family medicine. I actually have a very similar challenge here at home in the Bahamas. And my question to you is knowing that advocating is going to be such a multi-level task, what is a small way perhaps that young doctors could go about when it comes to advocating for ourselves to reduce burnout as well as to increase joy in the workplace? Is there something that you have um, advised your residents or is there something in particular that seems to be working in your region? I'm just very curious and anxious to get any ideas from anyone about how do you start to change this medical and um, culture that we that we are currently facing thank you hi renee uh, thank you for your question i would say that um one of the best things that we are able to do it's um improve communication and that might seem um ironic you know, when we try to reduce burnout, but um, but it goes hand in hand with advocating for yourself, even um, at the most simple level that is your, your place of work, your office um, and your organization. If you're able to advocate for yourself to have um, proper uh, team training from your front desk to your nurse, your medical assistant, um, and other ancillary staff in your practice, whoever is available. I know that, um, you know, resources are uh, different um, throughout our countries, but if you have well-trained, motivated um, staff, it can really make your life easier and reduce burnout while improving communication. So your patients feel that they have access to you on a proper time, in a timely manner, um, an adequate way, but also improving their care because now there's documentation in their shard. But if you work as a team and have proper um, training for your team, they will be able to triage or discern who really needs your attention or what can be taking care of them. Like if the patient just calls you for a refill and a prescription or um, you know, needing their yearly um, supplies for their chronic condition. If you have protocols in place for your medical assistant, nurse or staff to be able to refill that automatically instead of adding that to your to-do list for the day of the week, that can definitely reduce your burnout because um, now you're going home earlier. You're going home um, more rested and with less things to do, because sometimes it's just the little things that keep burdening you. Um, so I would say that definitely advocating just for better communication training at your office will reduce the burnout. Um, you know, especially now with the globalized era where um, there's just an endless to-do list, having a well-motivated team can help you. And sometimes the team actually does want more work, um, but it's really not more work. They want to feel motivated. So if you give them that different um, 
things to do and different tasks, they will feel motivated. Uh, and always check in on them. Check with the front desk, your receptionist. Check with the nurse. Check with everyone to see. And if you see gaps in their training, sometimes when it comes to certain conditions, you can even do in service for them. Um, but that's a way where you can actually start advocating right from the get-go um, and also help you reduce the burnout. And that's actually how I tell my patients, my residents to start advocating, to just start small, just start in your office, just start with yourself, just start with your practice. And once you realize that you're able to move through that, um, you know, you can start going maybe even to your council members in your town or city. Thank you, Natalia. Um, thank you so much, Brune, for your question. And I think uh, Natalia has addressed it quite adequately. And I love the emphasis on teamwork because I think that's what sometimes causes a lot of burnout in young doctors just starting out in rural practice or starting out their practices. So thank you so much for that. I've uh, looked through, I'm not seeing any other raised hands. There's a question on the chat about um, the respective um, universal health coverage percentages um, in your countries. So I think you can um, answer that as um, we wrap up. And I'd like to get us parting short from each of the panelists. Um, if you could just um, give maybe just one um, word of advice to a young doctor, a young family doctor somewhere, either just starting out in rural practice or intending to start out in rural practice and who has seen all the amazing things that you have done, what would it be? I'm going to start with you, Dr. Guha. Sorry, Dr. Guha, please go ahead and unmute. Uh, for any young physician who is willing to start his uh, practice in a rural area, first, I mean, uh, see, he should be, he or she must uh, keep this in mind that there will be challenges and there will be, uh, there will be a lack of facilities in the rural areas. Uh, the first thing he should, he or she should keep in mind because if you, if we constantly are having problems in our own lives, then we cannot, uh, and we are keep, we keep on thinking about that, then we cannot do better for the community. So after that acceptance, then we can, uh, uh, I mean, the either there are two ways, either he can serve in a public facility or government facility, or uh, he can start his or her own practice. So in those ways, uh, he, can, he or she can start. And then uh, I'll just say that uh, rural practice is very uh, rewarding and uh, gradually you will, uh, anyone when, uh, by starting it, then you will like it then you can uh, make a lot of uh, changes, a uh, significant difference to the community in reducing their morbidity. Uh, so you should have a goal in mind. And then uh, if you keep uh, start taking small steps, then eventually you will uh, succeed in that. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Guha. A round of applause for Dr. Guha. I think we'll, have, um, we'll, we'll be able to share presentations later. And you can see all the amazing work he has done. Uh, Dr. Ayatan? I think that, excuse me, uh, if I'm going to say anything, my biggest advocacy would be for a mentorship program for rural health doctors. Um, the thing is that rural health is not very attractive because of all the different challenges we've seen here. Some people are in rural health because they didn't have a job in an urban center. But then they got to love the job that he did in the rural areas. Um, like when I listened to Dr. Young's story, you know, he said how he ended up, where he ended up wasn't his intention, but he made use of what happened there. Now, to make it sustainable, we have to look for either informal or formal mentorship programs for people who are in rural areas to encourage new doctors coming into rural areas to show them the path and going up. Other thing I'm going to talk about is only I'm going to emphasize is the need for collaboration. Collaboration with, um, with your peers, collaboration with people in our uh, network with other people. See what other people are doing. Don't go through this alone. People have gone through it. They've had challenges. They've had ways that they've gone around these challenges. 
and they're happy to share from these experiences. And that's why a meeting like this is very helpful to see that you're not alone in your struggle. The other people are struggling with different resource challenges and you're gonna make a progress. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Aitang, for being with us, sharing your experience, and most of all, bringing up the aspect of mentorship. I think that is the key thing that a lot of doctors, young young family doctors in rural practice are in need of. <clears throat> to Dr. Natalia, then I'll have Dr. Young close, um, close for us. Dr. Natalia? I, I would second what Dr. Guha and Islam have said. Um, rural practice is actually very fulfilling. Um, I think when we, well, when I imagine, you know, what in the old times being an old family doctor, that's exactly what rural family medicine does. Like you're able to do full spectrum family medicine. You, you know the moms when they're pregnant, you see when the babies are born. And then you're able to follow the auntie, the mom, you know, the grandmother from that family. So it's very fulfilling. You really are part of the community in a rural practice. Um, but yeah, you have to also wear a lot of hats. You have to be management. You have to community advocate, behavioral health specialist. And sometimes because of the lack of resources, be creative on how you're going to use them. Um, I always say that I would choose this specialty again and I would choose this career again. Um, but but you, you have to take into account that like any specialty in medicine is hard. It's a different lifestyle. So you, um, and you, you have to be creative and adapted and have that flexibility to roll with the punches, but also find the joy that not every specialty gives you. We truly have continuity of care. Uh, we will see that patient back. We, you know, different from uh, ophthalmologists that will only see that patient once a year and maybe that. And they will, they will not know, you know, that the quinceanera or the sweet 16 for their daughter uh, happened that summer. Um, yeah. but, but you will. Uh, or at least you can have that when you're a family doctor. Um, so it's a very fulfilling and a very um, simple way. And, um, but yeah, very, very rewarding. Uh, I think I, you truly find happiness. It's like the same thing. It's the simple things, it's the little things that give you happiness. And that's what you find in family practice. And in the background is my baby. I don't know if you're hearing her. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Apologize, Natalia. I think this is part of like this issue of balancing professional and also, you know, personal life. So this is part of it. So say hi to the young one. She's so pretty. And thank her for joining us and letting her mom join us as well. Thank you so much, Natalia. And I think um, I wish you all the best with the residency program because that is also part of mentorship. And that's a very great initiative. Over to you, Dr. Young. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to um, networking with all of you. Uh, it's really a blessing. And, you know, I can't agree much with uh, Dr. Guha, Dr. Itang, and Dr. Natalia that, you know, um, this um, being a family medicine specialist, being a family doctor um, is extremely uh, rewarding. Um, and, um, um, you know, I am uh, extremely thankful, you know, uh, to be uh, you know, given the opportunities to pursue, um, you know, the master program and to be a family medicine specialist. And I really enjoy what I'm doing right now. You know, um, family medicine specialists, we need to be um, very versatile, you know, we need to be teachers, friends, clinicians, you know, uh, policy makers, you know, and during the pandemic, you know, uh, we do a lot of public health work, you know, running, you know, the vaccination centers, you know, the COVID assessment centers, you know, and um, our role, you know, as family medicine specialists has, you know, become more uh, prominent um, during the pandemic and, um, and, and after the pandemic. So 
you know, coming back to rural health, you know, I, I um, um, you know, rural health medicine has never been my cup of tea, you know, when life, you know, you know, throw you a lemon, you just need to uh, make it, uh, you know, turn it into a cup of uh, nice iced lemon tea. Uh, it was very tough for me. I was separated uh, with my families for months uh, during the pandemic. Um, extremely difficult, extremely difficult. And uh, I'm glad that Dr. Natalia, you know, talk about um, mental health, talk about self-care. I think it's extremely important because we are much um, isolated, you know, um, not only from uh, our own people, our culture, but as well as our family members. Um, and um, one thing that I learned is that um, the need is extremely um, a lot in rural areas and sustainability is very important because, um, you know, people just come and go. The turnaround rate is extremely high for uh, uh, healthcare providers in rural areas. So um, for whatever services that I've established in Song Kapit in uh, Sarawak, I, I always tell my staff that I am not important. The important is the system. I will come and I will leave, but the system has to stay. So whatever that um, my team has learned, I tell them that they have to pass on uh, the skill and knowledge um, to the new team yeah, to ensure sustainability. And, um, you know, um, Malaysia is, um, is an upper middle um, uh, income country. We do not have a lot of resources. And uh, it is very important that you look into um, the local resources that you have and get the involvement of the community um, uh, to provide uh, the care. Care is not just about medication. It's about uh, clean water. It's about prevention. So there are a lot of community-based uh, activities that you can uh, carry out, you know, um, to sustain or to promote health. Um, last but not least, you know, um, you know I think uh, being uh, a family uh, doctor, you know, we are blessed with um, lots of skills, you know, from basically, you know, we can uh, care for anyone that walk into our clinic uh, from womb to tomb. And uh, we should take pride of what we are doing. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Young. And I like that we take care of people from womb to tomb. And healthcare is not just about medicine, it's about everything else that supports life. Thank you so much. Um, I want to recognize the presence of um, we have our uh, Wonka Africa Chair, Dr. Dana Bubakar, who's made time to join us today, and also the Secretary, Dr. Kwame. Thank you so much for making uh, time to join us today. I think um, we'll have you say something before Dr. Etang closes the meeting. Uh, just to highlight some resources that are available from the Wonka Working Party on Rural Practice, we have a mentorship program. We call it the Mentor Mentee Program that we started, uh, started a few years ago. We've done round one. Now we are doing the Mentor Mentee Program 2.0, where we have older uh, family, uh, uh, um, not older in terms of the age, but also experience, mentoring young doctors and also students who would like to go into rural health practice. So when you go to the website, you'll see more about that program. We also have um, the Wonka Rural Health um, Guidebook, so there's a guidebook that ha is also on the website. So if you need that resource, it's also there amongst other resources, including journals where you can find research on um, rural health practice as well. So I've put the link to the website on the chat and you can look into that as well. And also for your local YDM, there are so many other programs that can offer you a community of practice as well as support and mentorship because there is also peer-to-peer -peer mentorship. So you can also go to the Wonka website and join your regional YDM because every region in the world has a young doctors movement like everyone that's hosting the webinar today. So please join that for a community of practice and for peer-to-peer -peer mentorship as well. And with that, I'd uh, been your moderator, Dr. Matthew Anjala. I'm a family physician from Kenya, also in rural practice, 
Oh, and before I forget, we also have the Wonka Rural Seeds Program for young healthcare professionals who want to be groomed into leadership in rural practice, advocacy in rural practice as well. Back to you, Dr. Etan. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. As we bring this webinar to a close, I want to ex express my sincere gratitude to all of you for joining us today to discuss the role of young family doctors in addressing rural health challenges. And this has been an insightful and a thought-provoking session um, filled with meaningful discussions, valuable insights, and inspiration. We've delved into the key challenges faced by rural areas and explored the critical roles. Um, we discussed some of the barriers to healthcare, the strategies for community engagement, and the importance of collaborative approaches to overcome limited resources and infrastructure. Our esteemed panelists have shared their expertise and experiences, shedding light on the innovative interventions and successful case studies um, uh, from Black, I love Dr. Young's story and the transformative power of young family doctors in making a difference in rural healthcare. Your remarkable insights and dedication have truly inspired us all to continue working towards achieving equitable and accessible healthcare for all, particularly um, in, in rural areas. I also want to expand, extend a special thanks to all of your attendees, especially the young doctors who are at the forefront of this healthcare revolution. Your eagerness to learn, your, to adapt, and to innovate will drive positive changes and pave a way for, in my opinion, better healthcare outcomes, uh, not only in your rural place, but across the globe. So I just want to encourage you all to just continue to stay informed, continue learning, active, um, actively engage with initiatives and organizations that are dedicated um, to improving rural health care. Uh, as Natalia says, be a voice of change, advocate for policies that promote equitable health, access to health care, and never underestimate the impact that you make as young, doctor, young family doctors. So on behalf of my team, I want to express our gratitude again to esteemed panelists, attendees, and everyone involved in making this webinar a success. Thank you for your time, your contributions, and commitments to what's making a difference. So remember that the journey to improving rural healthcare does not end here. It begins with each and every one of us. Thank you and farewell. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye and have a great week ahead. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.